I think it's okay. <laughs> okay. Hey, Karen, how's it going? Hi. Hello, How it's Julie. You? All right, we're all here. Great. Let me let me make you a host so you can share your screen. Okay, and I can put a background on if you think that's necessary. No, no, it's fine. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, you'll just see my PowerPoint anyway. <laughs> exactly. Well, we'll see. You know, your head will be like a tiny thing, and then mostly your PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Which Smita. Is Hi. Hello. It's lovely when you're just talking to yourself anyway. <laughs> I know. I, I think Zoom is a little, not as bad as Teams. Teams is weird. And then when people mute, it's like, it's really bad. It's a complete like sensory deprivation while you're talking. It's, uh, you know, which we know is bad. <laughs> so Karen, we'll start at um, a little bit late just to give people time to join in. Um, maybe 1033 is my official in-person and then on Zoom starting time. Uh, we have until about uh, 1145 and people might leave a little bit before that. Um, and this group usually is good at asking questions. I will say that this format has <laughs> sort of blunted the questions, but hopefully we'll do our best to ask. I'll let people put them in the chat and I'll, you know, I'll say, I'll, I'll let them unmute themselves and ask their own questions. But if they want to put them in the chat, I'll just read them to you at the end or something like that. Okay. So. And if you could read the chat ones, I'm not particularly good at negotiating. Of course. No, me neither. So <laughs> I can, even when I'm not speaking, so I will, we will do our best. <laughs> so far, right? We've been okay. <laughs> oh. Yeah, the chat always surprises me. I'm like, oh God, something's happening down there. So <laughs> oh, I'm recording. Let me stop recording. Let me hit record. Okay. Um, I'm, we're going to have Dr. Lahodi introduce our colleague, Dr. Fondacara. So go ahead, Smita. It's all yours. And one, let me say a couple of other things. Sorry, I can't stop talking. At the end, we'll have questions. We'll, you can unmute yourselves, put on your video. You can ask uh, Dr. Fondacara some questions, or you can put them in the chat and I'll try to see them and, and read them to her. So we'll do that after. All right, go ahead, Smita. All right. Thank you. So Dr. Karen Panakaro is a clinical psychology professor at UVM and a director of the Vermont Psychological Services Center. Over the past 35 years, her clinical work and research has focused on interpersonal violence and the mental health of survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, and political conflict. In 2007, Dr. Fondacaro established Connecting Cultures, a clinical science program designed for the mental health needs of refugees and asylum seekers. In 2009, she co-founded NEST, the New England survivor of torture and trauma. Connecting Cultures and NEST have collaborated with numerous community organizations and served refugees from over 30 countries of origin. Dr. Fondacaro has been the principal investigator on federal grants regarding refugee mental health, like the NIH SBIR. She also conducts numerous national and international academic presentations and has published in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, on refugee mental health. Dr. Fandakaro and the Connecting Cultures Program is the recent regional winner of the 2020 W.K. Kellogg Foundation Community Engagement Scholarship Award. And in a couple of weeks, uh, she will be representing UVM and competing for the national award, uh, which will be uh, announced in November, 2020. I've known Karen um, since the second year of my residency and she has been an empowering and uplifting mentor to me as she has been to many others. Um, this is a part of her personality that just shines through as does her heart. So ladies and gentlemen, I present Karen Fundagaro. Go ahead, Karen. Thank you, Smita. Smita has been our um, resident in Connecting Cultures and she's been an incredible incredible addition to our group. So thanks, Smita. It's very, very nice of you. So I'm going to share my screen here. And I'm going to find my presentation. And I'm going to put my glasses on and start my slideshow. Can everyone see that? Okay, great. So the name of this presentation is Connecting Cultures, A Bridge to a Growing Community. And I like to start with Lady Liberty because she has enlightened the world and she was a gift from France. About a hundred years of friendships is what they were commemorating and that's the American flag and the French flag and the poet Emma Lau 
Lazarus in 1883 created the New Colossus. It was a poem that she raised to basically raise money to put the poem on the bottom of the pedestal. And there it is. And this is the poem that she created, The New Colossus. And I would love for people to unmute their, um, their microphones and state this poem with me so we can understand what we're talking about. Okay, if you're comfortable. So I'll start, but I would love for you to join me. So it's, give me your tired, your poor. Your huddled and yearning the I lift my lamp by the Doesn't want to go forward. Thank you everyone for doing that with me. And Tempest Toss means that we're accepting people who are pounded or hit repeatedly by adversities. That these are people who've been troubled or characterized by some kind of distress or have fallen into some kind of trouble. And this is exactly what we're talking about when we talk about welcoming refugees to the United States and immigrants. And the Statue of Liberty has really become, or became, I should say, a symbol of welcome and the message that we treat all people equally. Or I like to say it's what I term social justice, an important concept. So today what I'm going to do is first talk a little bit about refugees and survivors of torture, talk about some statistics for the US and Vermont, the history of connecting cultures and NEST. NEST is the New England survivors of torture and trauma and some findings from our clinical work and research. And then if there's time, depending upon how many stories I break into, if there's time, um, I'd love to start going into our culturally responsive treatment that we've designed, the CTST, the Chronic Traumatic Stress Treatment Model. So a refugee is a person living outside his or her country. They've been unable to gain protection from their country based on persecution on account of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular group or political opinion. And when I say membership in a particular social group, one group that I worked with a, with a young man who was basically tortured in his country because he was gay. And he, he actually came to Vermont to seek asylum and was given asylum because if he went back to his country, he was going to be tortured again. About 20% of refugees are survivors of torture. And the formal definition of torture is basically that it's the government has participated in some way in creating the torture and violence against someone. The mental pain or suffering, it could be severe physical or mental pain. So they've either been involved in it or they haven't been able to protect that some militia has broken out and the government cannot protect their people. And there were numerous examples of this from the individuals that we see from many different cultures. And Smita said over 30 different countries of origin. And that's, believe it or not, who we have in Vermont, little old Vermont, over 30 countries, including Iraq, Congo, um, Somalia, Bhutan, I could go on and on but about 68 million refugees and IDPs. Does anyone know what an IDP is? Can someone speak up if they do? Okay. Displaced an person? IDP, yes, an internally displaced person. So that's a refugee who actually is displaced internally. 
Um, 26 million refugees worldwide and the largest number recorded in history. And something a lot of people don't know is that 50% of refugees are children. The US used to have about 95,000 refugees annually, 95,000 annually from 1980 to 2017. And under Obama, we've had as many as 110,000. Now, the, the number of refugees who come into the US is determined by a presidential determination plan or PD, presidential determination. So it really depends on the particular administration that we have. And what has happened under the current administration this has decreased significantly. So the determination in 2019 was 30,000 refugees. You can see how that significantly dropped. 2020, it was 18,000. And then recently our president changed it to 15,000 for 2020. And so far since January till the end of September, there's about 9,000 folks who have been able to come in. Now, COVID has had something to do with that also. Based on presidential determination, but then this is a graph of actual resettlement. And you can see by this graph very clearly that the United States really did lead other countries for decades. And that you can see right after 9-11, um, there was a dip because we had many, many concerns during that time. But then you can see now in 2018 and on, 2000, it's actually 2017 and on from the new administration, it has really dropped significantly below other countries in terms of who the president determines can come in as a refugee. In Vermont, we have about 8,000 refugees. And again, I said that they are from over 30 countries and the number has remained pretty consistent, about 336 folks each year, but the numbers fell dramatically. In 2017, we uh, resettled 236 refugees. In 2019, 115. And January to September, of this year, 23 individuals. So a very big difference depending upon administration. And I should also say that it started in, um, in the 1980s under Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter started the um, Refugee Act. And that was really when a greater number of refugees were allowed to come into our country. Although of course, um, for a very long time, we've had immigrants coming into our country and refugees are a subset of immigrants. So in 2007, I was asked, would I be able to conduct my parenting group that I had been doing with refugee clients? And I was asked by the state, I was in a meeting and I thought to myself, hmm, that is very interesting. And I also really thought to myself at that time that that's something I really wanna do and something I could see myself doing for a long time working with refugees. Now, I didn't know much at the time. I really have gained quite a bit of knowledge over time, but so they wanted a parenting program. And the reason they wanted a parenting program was because there were a number of individuals from African countries who had come over to Vermont and back in their countries, corporal punishment was accepted. So when they got here, they were sort of told, you know, whatever has worked for you before, and it did work for them, whatever worked for you before, you cannot do that. You might have your children taken away. And think about the fear related to that, that they're, make their way to this country. And then there's a concern if they use a strategy that they're very used to using, that they're at risk of losing their kids. So we started, well, actually the first, first thing we started in 2007 
is I held a big breakfast in um, one of the churches downtown and about 40 African men came at the time and I spoke in English and someone spoke, spoke in Somali, um, Somali, someone spoke in Mai Mai and someone spoke in French and it was totally wild. I felt like I was jumping off the cliff at, a t at that time. And we um, basically, I had my PowerPoint and I was ready to teach them about parent training, but that was not um, gonna work. And it was a very good learning experience right away. Um, right away, I got hands up asking me questions like, why do you have your children leave at the age of 18? Why do you let your daughters dress the way that you do? Um, on and on with different questions. And another question that really struck me, <coughs> excuse me, was um, how do you stop your kids from calling social services because they want to watch certain channels on television. So it became very clear that the children were really gaining more power um, in families, just like um, that's always happened with immigrant families. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, in 2007, we didn't just start a program and say to people, you know, come to our clinic, we knew that wasn't going to happen. They were not, refugees were not receiving mental health services at the time. So <clears throat> we started with community outreach. I really, a number of graduate students and me, we went to the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. It was a small house at that time on Elmwood. And we would just sit there and we literally sat there for about two years and got to know different refugee families. And we also started doing focus groups. <clears throat> it's not COVID by the way, <laughs> I don't think, I'm joking, it's not. Um, we started doing focus groups and in the focus groups we were asking people what is your definition of mental health? What does that mean to you? What does mental illness and mental health mean to you? And what can you imagine that people might say from other cultures? Anyone have an answer? You can yell it out. Crazy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So their understanding of mental health was, it means I'm crazy. Why would anybody receive services if it meant that they were going to say, hi, I'm crazy, can I get some services? So we really started reaching out to the community and I would say educating the community, but it wasn't just us educating the communities, they were educating us. And we were really learning about who they were. And so eventually, as a big surprise to me, people started coming into the clinic. And now over the last 13 years or so, we have grown dramatically. We continue with community outreach, <clears throat> but we have direct clinical services. At times we have wait lists of over a hundred. We conduct clinical evaluations and um, we have a research repository that I'll talk about in a little bit. We also provide presentations and trainings. So it's really grown quite a bit since that initial outreach time. And I'd like to impress upon everyone that community outreach is really what has made this happen. And whenever we reduce our community outreach and we're not as connected to the communities, we don't do as well with our work. So then in 2009, I wrote a federal grant to the Office of Refugee Resettlement Administration of, Administration of Children and Families. And we basically joined with legal services. They were different legal services before, but it was clear that the refugees we were seeing for mental health needed legal services. And they needed legal services to try to bring other family members over to 
apply for asylum. So right now we partner with the Vermont Law School. Our mental health services, which we've called Connecting Cultures and the overall program NEST, sometimes it gets confusing. We sometimes think about calling the whole program Connecting Cultures. That's probably one of our next steps. But we provide psychological services at our clinic within the university, but we also have a satellite office at AALV, and that's the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. And they don't only serve Africans, they serve all refugee communities. They're an amazing organization. We work really well with them, and um, ALV is the one that we received our um, award for the Kellogg Award that Smita was talking about. We also realized very early on that if you have PTSD, that's one thing. If you have post-traumatic stress symptoms, that's one thing. But if you haven't eaten or you're unemployed and you need assistance with employment, we really needed social work. We really needed social work and we continue to, and we have a wonderful social work team led by Chelsea Day, and it's the social work uh, master's students that provide the services. And for the psychological services, it's the primarily graduate students in clinical psychology. And um, also we have some faculty too. Lauren Dewey is a faculty member in Connecting Cultures and NEST. And then, as I said, we have a psychiatry resident, and that is Smita, and she really collaborates with our psychologists. For physical health, physical therapy has become incredibly important when people are tortured, they experience chronic pain. And when you have a physical therapist who doesn't have expertise in treating torture survivors, that can really lead to problems. So our physical therapist um, coordinator, our director is, doc, is um, Justine D. And she's in the exercise and rehabilitation sciences program at UVM. And she really teaches her students and has her doctoral students learn how to work with refugees and torture survivors. And if you've ever gone into a physical therapy office and seen some of that machinery they have, it can be horribly scary for a torture survivor. First time I went through when Justine and I started working together, I was like, wow, we have to talk. <laughs> this is, could be very scary for people. Um, also, we provide medical referrals. Okay, this is part of the team. I need to update it um, with some of our new team members. And as a matter of fact, we now have graduate students from other countries um, who are interested in connecting cultures and apply to the program. And so we have a number of students who um, have been in other countries and we're extremely lucky because they speak um, other languages. We, um, we have someone who speaks Burmese, someone who speaks French and um, Arabic. So it's um, really, our group has become more diverse too. We have a number of funding agencies. As I said, the Agency of Human Services, Office of Refugee Resettlement. We have worked on an NIH SBIR and that's a small business innovation research grant. We created an app that is language free. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. We have a United Way grant. We had a United Nations grant, private donations, and also some um, funding from AgeWell. And that's when we work with older, older folks. So we really do now work with people of all ages. And Lauren Dewey, our faculty member, um, really has grown our youth services and our child services, and we're in the schools providing services. So there are three phases of migration. Phase one is the pre-migration phase. That's when the political conflict is occurring. And if you can think of Iraq or Baghdad, where that's when the bombs are going off, homes are being ruined, people are being, areas are being corded off so that people can't eat properly. 
Um, phase two is the in the transit or flight, and that is a very challenging time for people. They often end up in refugee camps. And in transit or flight is when many children might die. And so there's loss of kids. I worked with a woman once who had to decide because she had really been running on which child to leave behind. And that was a horrible, horrible situation. So in transit or flight is another challenging time. So let me just step back for a second. So people have to apply for refugee status. They have to fill out applications. So already it's a very small percentage of people who could possibly come over or who need assistance. So then they have to go through the, the um, getting here. And when they get here after their transit or their flight from the trauma and torture, there's a post-migration phase. Initially, it's sort of like there's a relief because people are alive and um, glad to be alive. But then the, the post-migration difficulties really include financial challenges, needing to get employment, having to pay back the flight for their um, two spouses and five children that they've brought over. They have to pay that back after eight months. They get some financial assistance for eight months, but then after that, so post-migration becomes a very difficult time too. And people really need um, assistance to be successful in integrating. And I think, um, you know, we need to welcome people into a situation where they can be successful, not just welcome them into poverty. So there have been a number of mental health studies on refugees and the most common Western diagnosis that is applied is PTSD. Anxiety, depression and somatic complaints. And if you read studies on mental health associated with refugees, that is what you'll see, these um, diagnoses. And those are from a Western perspective, obviously. What we see, and I just wanna emphasize, obviously with the twirl, resilience and strength, real resilience and strength. The refugees who make it here and are are really surviving here, it's amazing what kind of strength and resilience they have. They really are a remarkable group of people. And what we also find is that they're coping with political atrocities. They're coping with torture and trauma. They have grief over loss of family members, loss of their culture and home. They're experiencing poverty, language barriers, adjustment to a new culture, unemployment, ongoing trauma and torture experiences. And how we really learned about the ongoing is the political conflict is still occurring in the homes uh, back in their, their countries of origin. So we were working with um, someone from Somalia and it had turned out that a night before the group, her aunt had been horribly tortured and killed. And here we were in the middle of a group working on sort of the trauma issues and realizing this is not past trauma. This is really ongoing. Domestic violence is a big problem, substance abuse and suicidality, especially for the Bhutanese population. Now, we realized very early on that there are limitations of the PTSD construct for refugees and torture survivors. We learned that they're not post. And we also, a lot of the evidence-based treatments start with, you know, session one, we tell you, you have post-traumatic stress disorder. That was not gonna fly with our refugee clients. It felt disrespectful. It did not um, at all feel like the way to start. There were also the ongoing stressors, again, stressors through pre-migration, flight, and resettlement. And also that the PTSD construct does not take cultural context into it, account. So we really realized that we needed to build a framework 
beyond PTSD. And ideally, because we're in an academic environment, we wanted to build one that would guide empirical investigation, but also guide clinical work. So what we came up with was the Chronic Traumatic Stress Model, CTS framework, and it's a biopsychosocial spiritual model. And I'm gonna put my glasses on for this. Um, so the stressful events include past and current war trauma and political conflict. The stressful events also include post-migration living difficulties. They also include daily stressors. If you look at the outcomes, we do have psychological and physical wellness because when you're providing services, you really do wanna look at functionality, not just what's wrong with people. And of course, we're gonna look at psychological and physical distress, but then also traumatic stress symptoms. You can't ignore those. And then there are moderating variables. And we really, I really feel like this piece, the moderating variables is, I always say it's sort of like, it's what keeps me honest, which is that it's not just at the individual level that someone experiences these things. You have to look at the family level, the community level, and culture and spiritual. And interestingly, when I first started working with refugees, it's not just that one person would come into the waiting room, you'd have a whole family in there. So the family was certainly important. And if you just look at a PTSD framework, you can see by these red circles, you're just looking at past events, you're looking just at the individual, and you're just looking at traumatic stress symptoms, none of the other. So we use this guide and we've used this guide to develop our treatment and also to conduct some research. So the chronic traumatic, chronic traumatic stress is not a disorder, but rather the contextual experience of persistent traumatic events, both past and continued, that occur at any point across the lifespan with sequelae that are perceived by the individual as impairing, regardless of symptom constellation or thresholds. And we've um, published an article on this and I'm happy to send any of that to folks if people are interested. We've also done um, clinical research with refugees and just wanna put in there that building trust is critical to doing any research with refugees. And you'll notice that the with is capitalized because it's not doing research on refugees. It really is doing research with refugees. So we really had to build trust before we could do any clinical research. And I know I've been approached by other people who wanna do research who haven't worked with refugees, but have wanted to include refugees in their samples. And they've come to me and asked me, you know, how do I, how do I get refugees in my research? Not exactly like that, but you know what I'm saying. And it's like, well, you sit with them for two years and you hang out and you build trust in order to work with people. Um, so as I said, we started with our focus groups and now we have a repository. And the first repository that we have, and what it is, is that when we conduct our clinical intake, we ask clients, is it okay if we use this information for research? And most refugees do say yes to us. We have to be careful with consent because in many cultures like Bhutan, um, what I was taught by some of my cultural consultants was we don't, we're not really good at saying no. So you have this issue with consent that you really wanna make sure that someone has said yes to this. But we have a data set of about 197 um, refugee clients that have come into the clinic and it's the Connecting Cultures team of graduate students who do these intakes. Now in 2017, we said, oh, we really need to change our repository and make it even more culturally responsive. We've learned so much over the years. So in 2019, we really redid the measures and we started our repository. We have 31 people who've done the intake, but um, then COVID set in. 
set in, sat in and set in. And so the problem has been now is with IRB for me, which is I can't really explain how it's not possible if we're doing intakes over the internet with a refugee population, it's not possible to get signatures. And I get suggestions like, oh, just mail it to them. If you mail them a consent form, they won't know one piece of mail from another piece. So I haven't been able to yet figure out a way that we can we're continuing to do the intakes and continuing to take on new clients, but um, I can't figure out a way to get IRB to pass it so that we can actually use some of the data for research. Um, Some of the students have done, we've done a number of dissertations and other studies. Jonah Meyerhoff did a study with the Bhutanese on on suicide. Ann Brassel did a, a dissertation on a mother infant dyad where they did the um, Bailey with little kids and also did an observation and incredible database. And then variables associated with attrition, Emily Pickler had 196 refugees compared with 165 non-refugee clients. We also do, did a pilot study for our mental health app that we created. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And um, we also have done actually a pilot study of telehealth during COVID-19 and some of the um, socio-cultural and structural barriers for refugees to receive mental health services. And we now have a data set of 90, but I haven't looked at that yet. So our clinic repository, this just gives you an idea of who we see in the clinic. And interestingly, this is the one from 2009 to 2017. And it's changed a little bit. We have so many more kids now, thanks to Lauren, um, Dr. Dewey. Um, So this is based on 178 of our um, refugees who've come in and interesting, Look at this, 48% men. That's not a typical clinical population. You usually have many more women than men. So that's surprising. But we also did reach out to the, some of the elders and, and um, people and males in the communities, let's say. And also mean age, 42, 42 years old. Um, Over 50% either never attended school or had some secondary school in the country of origins, the top countries, again, we've worked with 30, but the tops are Bhutan, Somalia, Bosnia, Iraq, and Bosnia was, uh, is really interesting that we're working with Bosnian clients because these are individuals who really came much earlier than the newer refugees, Bhutanese and the Somali Bantu. And the the Bosnians are really dealing with tortures and torture and trauma that they've experienced quite some time ago, but they're definitely impacted, continue to be impacted by it. And I probably don't need to tell this group, you know, that. Um, Myanmar, Congo, and also, So those are the top, and um, for religion, the top religions are Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, and Buddhism. Interestingly, 78, um, almost 79% of our population, of our sample had been in a refugee camp and greater than 50% had a torture survivor status. Now, I think we have to remember that this is a clinical population so it's, it, it is a slightly different population than what other studies have who have reached out to the communities. Um, so one of the studies um, that I wanted to talk about briefly was the study that, that we found that psychological flexibility mediated the relationship between torture and symptoms. And let me just explain, for those of you, you, there's probably some of you in here who know the ACT framework, acceptance and commitment therapy, and psychological flexibility is seen really as the goal of intervention and also seen as what 
um, mental health is. And just very briefly, it's when you are um, committed to behaviors, it's very behavioral, committed to behaviors that are in line with your values. And at the same time, you can be in the present moment and accept the fact that you have challenging emotions, which we all do. And also to that you don't, that you can unhook from your thoughts. That's the cognitive diffusion is the technique. So what we found, we had 71 um, refugees in our first repository. They were both a torture survivor and they had filled out the AAQ, which is the acceptance and action questionnaire, which is associated with, with ACT. And we found that psychological flexibility mediated the relationship between torture status and post-traumatic stress. It mediated the relationship between torture status and depression and the same with anxiety. So it was really interesting about our sample, our clinical sample was that torture status was not related to symptoms of post-traumatic stress, anxiety, or depression really different than any studies you see out there, but that's because we have a clinical sample, I think, at least that's a hypothesis. Um, but with greater psychological flexibility, torture survivors who experienced greater psychological flexibility also had fewer symptoms, and those with um, less psychological flexibility had greater symptoms. So that was an interesting, and I should say, this was um, a study that um, Brandon Gray, Lauren Dewey, and I, we've published this study and it should come out soon. Now, I'm gonna transition a little to suicide. I sort of picked the ones that I thought were the most interesting. And, and I also think that it's important for people to know in the mental health field that Bhutanese refugees experience suicide at a two times higher rate than US individuals. And the Nepali, um, Nepali Bhutanese population is the largest in Vermont. So what the literature shows is that 57% of family or friends said that it was an impulsive act and 46% didn't recall any imminent signs. And also what's been found is that there are low rates of pseudo suicidal ideation. They are hidden ideators, so to speak. Ideation is stigmatized in the Bhutanese culture. And um, basically the belief in the literature is that it's due to downward social mobility and change in the collectivist culture to a more independent US culture. And traditional risk assessment relies on ideation. So the belief is that there's an under identification of folks who um, are experiencing suicidal ideation, suicidal thoughts. And we conducted a study, there needs to be more, greater studies done with larger numbers, but this was of a community sample. Jonah Meyerhoff did this with, with his dissertation and his NRSA grant. And, and we also, um, that part's not published, but we did publish a review article on suicide. Happy to share these things with folks again. But 29 out of 60 experienced some suicidal ideation or the desire to be dead. Four out of 60 experienced ideation, but all of those four also experienced the desire to be dead. 25 out of the 60 had no ideation, but a desire to be dead. So it's interesting that um, these Bhutanese refugee clients were much more willing to say, I, I have a desire to be dead, or some of the questions are, my life would be better if I wasn't here. And there is actually a questionnaire called the desire to be dead scale. And we use that in our intake now. And so it's something that needs to be studied further to really understand how we can assess for suicidality in the Bhutanese population. And we have had a number of suicides in our community. So it's really an important issue. But um, the other thing that 
that Jonah found in this study is that perceived burdensome predicted ideation and the desire to be dead. Now, this is interesting because clinically we see many people expressing that they feel like they're a burden to their families. And it just, you know, is a red flag for us and an interesting um, thing to know. And again, we need to do uh, more work to understand it further. Another study with the Connecting Cultures with Technology, this was done through our NIH SBIR grant. Again, it's a small business innovation research grant. And we partnered with a tech company. This was very fun <laughs> to partner with a tech company. I have a fly going around my face, by the way. Um, if it lands, please let me know. Um, so what we were finding is that language barriers present obviously disparities in mental health delivery and that the majority of refugees and survivors of torture have access to smartphones. But it was really hard to address between session practice. You know, in some of the work that we do, we actually give people homework assignments and things that are written down. And there was no way for people to practice um, what they've learned. So we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we created an app that was language free and people could use and it would go along with our treatment. So um, we had a, a cultural cult consultant from Bhutan and one from Somalia. They were our research assistants and that was so nice to actually work with people from other countries on our team to create this app and also work with um, the tech company. And boy, did they have nice offices, I have to say. They had a ping pong table <laughs> in the office. I was like, oh, I wanna work in here. You'd be kind of hard to do mental health there though. And so this is just a picture of the app. It's first people start out with an avatar and people really love making their own avatar. They can put a hijab on, they can put jewelry on, depending upon what, um, and again, it was geared more towards Somalia and Bhutan, but they can really dress themselves up with the, with the shade of their face on the avatar. And people really love doing this part of it, I have to say. Um, and we use the app, I mean, completely language free, and it has the modules that parallel the treatment that we have, um, that we've put together. And I've recently published with um, Emily Mazula and Holly Weldon, an article on the treatment along with the app and how to use it. And these are just different, um, it's kind of hard to see here, but there's the avatar maker, there's safety, and there's little things that people do, relaxation, valued living, grounding, sleep hygiene, working with thoughts, exercise, behavioral activation, distraction, guided deep breathing, and there's an emotion tracker where people can rate how distressed they are. And we did this pilot study that was totally wild to do. We, um, but it wasn't very many people. I think we ended up with 18 people who finished. We did, we ended up with 18 people who finished. We just submitted this. Um, and after a very brief um, intervention, um, we saw significant decreases in psychological distress, depression, anxiety, somatization and traumatic stress. That was shocking to me with such a small N. And also, um, and obviously not very intense statistics here, and an increase in coping strategies. So that was encouraging. Now we didn't get the second phase of our NIH SBIR. So um, we definitely need to find some more funding to finish that whole project and make sure that it's out there with our treatment. But some of what we've learned um, in Emily Pickler's, that the variables associated with attrition for refugees and also for non-refugees, by the way, was age and education. Psychological flexibility mediates the relationship between torture and mental health symptoms. 
English language lessons and community support during resettlement predicted lower mental health symptoms, no big surprise. Structural and sociocultural barriers exist during COVID-19. And I'm really looking forward to looking at that data set and um, seeing how that turns out. We did a, a small pilot with like, I think it was nine clinicians in connecting cultures. And it was interesting. One of the interesting things that turned out is that transportation and childcare was actually better for refugee clients, but not necessarily better for non-refugee clients. So that was an interesting piece. And that it may be important to assess the desire to be dead in Bhutanese refugees. So what are the critical elements? Outreach, outreach, outreach. Yes, that, I mean, again, I, um, one of our um, postdocs is currently Brandon Gray, Dr. Brandon Gray, he has been sitting in on the um, staff meetings of ALV. And I have to say, um, I've been really wishing it was me <laughs> and Brandon can't do it anymore. So I'm thinking about stepping into it, but it, it's a very rich experience to be right involved in the populations. And many of the populations stop right by ALV. I have an incredible team. I say taking risks, but that really goes back to in the beginning when I saw myself from afar um, running this breakfast and thinking, what the heck am I doing? And I felt like I was jumping off of a cliff. Um, dealing with ongoing ethical dilemmas, it's very challenging. Some of the ethical dilemmas that do come up, um, emotional tolerance, and that's something I talk to my students about a lot. It's quite a bit of, um, it's an incredible level of emotional tolerance that you have to develop as a clinician to deal with some of these stories. And we really have to support one another. We also have had some political involvement working on Medicaid for interpret interpreters. And one thing we're working on now is um, hoping to be able to, um, have our interpreters paid for, for social work. Um, benefits are vicarious resilience. And I can't, it's such a strange little word, I think, or words, but the meaning that you get doing this work and the way the team gets attached to the clients, but also attached to the work, it's just amazing. I have so many students who've gone out and continue to do the work. The idea that you're so exposed to diversity while living in little old Vermont, which I find very important. Um, the challenges of course are vicarious trauma. People do, my students end up with nightmares, sleep trouble, and it is part of the deal. And we have to talk about it and we also read a book together called Trauma Stewardship, where it takes the point of view that you're choosing to do this work and you're a trauma steward. And it's, um, it's actually a really good book. Um, and the students, I think, really benefit from it. Um, as a, I think I'll, I'll stop here. With, well, I won't stop, but I will end here with Here's a video that we made for our Kellogg McGrath Community Engagement um, Scholarship Award. And it's part of what we'll be competing with for this national award. So I thought I would just try to get this video in here. I'm not sure it's gonna work, but I'm gonna sit back with you and watch this for two minutes. It's a two minute video. Until Connecting Culture started reaching out to the new American community, we didn't have a tailored service to meet our need. I can say without mistake that this is the first organization that tailored their services to meet the need of the new American. Connecting Cultures is a program specifically designed for refugees and new Americans. And it started out as a mental health program. And we start with what's important to you. What's important to you? Because we believe that the more that we can build someone's strengths, the less that they struggle with anxiety and depression and some of the really intense, challenging emotions that come with some of the experiences. 
someone from Somalia might have lived different experiences than someone from Bhutan. And having a group that would always first listen, know the culture, and tailor the service to meet those needs has always been helpful to us and to the community we are working with. I think it's important to provide mental health services. However, I think it's very important to start with the fact that these are remarkable people and that the resilience and strength is really what shines through. So the students really learn you really can't just do research on people. You have to do research with people. You know, caring for us is not, it's not just a partner. It's uh, like uh, a mentor for all of us. Some people will come completely burned out, but after a few months or a few years, you will see that they said, now I'm feeling better. I want to go back to work. I want to help my family. Without doubt, say that uh, this has been a positive experience. Until so um, the next thing I could go into it, and I and I might just um, I still have a couple of minutes, so I might um, just start with our culturally responsive intervention for survivors of torture and trauma, the chronic traumatic stress treatment model, and I have three circles here because in the literature there are interventions that really are just based on. I shouldn't say just because it's very important based on support and then this sort of lime greenish thing um, is more coping skills and that would be meditation and then the blue circle um, is women sharing their torture stories and what we did is we basically um, created a program that includes all of them and here are the different modules. And we call them modules because it's not like session one, you do this, session two, you do that. It's very much based on um, the particular group you have in front of you. So we start with a mental health discussion. And so these are the three different um, levels. We start with a mental health discussion and really talk to people about what are your perceptions of mental health? What about in your culture? What do they think? And then we also talk about the US and we talk about what post-traumatic stress is, but we also talk about how we understand that it's really an ongoing, it can be ongoing for folks. We also talk about safety and how people can feel safe. And we spend some time on that and we have, we draw pictures with folks, and then we move to values and coping skills and emotion regulation, sleep hygiene, because so many people um, don't sleep and just talking about it and sharing strategies too is important. Behavioral activation, it's a fancy word, but that's really anything, any behavioral, um, any behavior that someone engages in and really helping people um, get up and engage more. Um, acceptance and tolerance of emotions. Obviously, this is all done in a culturally responsive way. Cognitive diffusion, it's, it's actually our working with thoughts. And then we do do narrative exposure and a lifeline exercise. I am going to stop right there and stop sharing my screen if I can figure out how to do that. The thing at the top. Um... Okay, I can like just... The red thing might say, stop sharing, unshare. Yeah. I don't know what it says. Got it, okay. Well, thank you, Karen. Again, what's missing from Zoom is the applause, but we applaud you. Um, it's a wonderful talk about your wonderful work. Um, and if folks have questions, if you wanna video, turn your video on, unmute yourselves, or you can put them in the chat. Give a few moments for people to pop in here. I can now look at names and see who I've been talking to. <laughs> Karen, I was gonna, um, thank you. I'm Andy Rosenfeld, I'm the psychiatrist at UVM and um, thank you for the work and the wonderful presentation. 
I just had a couple of logistical questions. One is um, you mentioned AALV a number of times and I wondered, has that become a common place for refugees and new Americans, including non-African like Bosnians or the Bhutanese that you mentioned? Yes, exactly. It started out as, um, for, as an African association, but it's individuals from every different culture come there and they're very comfortable there and they get lots of case, um, case management and um, sort of a, how to interface with different issues that they're having. But they'll call us when there's a crisis or something and we do have a clinical office there. And to tag on to that, a more technical question, I really like the diversity and creativity of the research studies that you did or are doing. And I wondered about the, I was confused on the suicidal ideation differentiation um, that a desire to be dead, I think in clinical practice, I would consider suicidal ideation. So I was wondering what the distinction was. You were saying people had a desire to be dead, but no suicidal ideation. Great question. I wish I had the questionnaire in front of me, but the desire to be dead includes items like if I wasn't here, my pain would go, or not even my pain would go away. That's more of a, an example. But um, if I weren't here, it would be better. I'd be better off dead. But um, it's, it gets answered differently than having suicidal ideation. Now, I, I need to understand it further, but we don't typically assess the desire to be dead. It's more, do you think about suicide? And in the Bhutanese culture, you would say, no, I would never do that. Do you think about killing yourself? Oh, no. Do you, you know, would you be better off dead? Yes. <laughs> so it's, it's a very interesting distinction. I see. Thank you. All right, other questions for Karen? Yeah, I, I have. Oh. Scott, is that you out there? It is. All right. Um, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Karen, for, for all you're doing and for that uh, wonderful presentation of, uh, of what it is you're doing. Um, it's, it's obviously good to be reminded that uh, although we're all preoccupied with domestic politics, um, the world scene is, uh, is not exactly uh, tranquil either. But in terms of our own political scene, it's, um, you know, it's, I think it's pretty widely acknowledged that, uh, that our own uh, society okay. hasn't been as divided as it is now. Since, uh, hello? It isn't as divided, hasn't been as divided as it is now since the Civil War. And I'm just wondering whether there are any systematic and if not anecdotal oh, data that bear on the question of, um, you know, where in the United States or where in North America in general, um, refugees from these spots are doing better versus worse. I think most of the people, maybe all of the people uh, in this meeting uh, are, uh, feel fortunate to be in Vermont. And uh, we would like to think that, uh, that our refugee populations feel that too. But I, I'm just wondering, uh, is, that, uh, is that the case? Or, or is there a great deal of heterogeneity uh, regarding where these refugees land in North America? There's, oh, there's over 100 resettlement areas. And Vermont is one of them. And you basically have to show that you have enough jobs. And th there are a number of qualifications to become a resettlement area. So um, they're spread all across the US. I think the highest, the largest number obviously are in Texas and California based on their size. I know the Somali Bantu refugees had a very challenging time in Maine, in Lewiston, Maine. That was a very challenging time. And I think it may have gotten a little better, but I'm not sure. Um, a lot of, um, 
a um, lot of discrimination and and I think discrimination, you know, is an issue across the board, but even worse during the last four years or so. So, but no, I don't know specifically what area, you know, some people do leave Vermont because they have a hard time getting a, a job and they might go to Ohio. Ohio also has a large um, population. Um, I'm not sure how much easier it's been for those folks though. I know in all areas, especially now, given given the um, the uh, I don't know what to call it <laughs> um, the the further challenges that have been thrown upon us, it's it's much harder. And I'm really interested to see our data pre 2016 and mental health symptoms versus our data post this administration. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Thank you again. I just had a question about interpreters. In the inpatient setting, it was always the dilemma of, do you get a local interpreter who also may know the individual from the community and the role of sometimes family offering, but really difficult to tease out what was the family dynamics within the home, safety, abuse, those kind of things. And it felt very impersonal sometimes with the internet or phone interpreter. And I was just curious, especially if there were psychotic symptoms, and I was curious what sort of advice you have on residents and inpatient work regarding that. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, when we first started, we didn't realize and we might have a family member but now we really would not use a family member and we use our interpreters through ALV. It's an interesting dynamic because we end up paying ALV through that and they provide us with the interpreters. It's another way that we're very connected, but um, they have certified and I say certified because they have a specific training they go through. And once in a while we'll get some, and we have run into this problem where someone who had quite a bit of power in the community would be the one interpreting. And it actually, when that becomes clear to us, we actually have to talk to the person and explain to them that you can't be an interpreter for this population in our clinic because you just have too much of a connection to this person. There are some cases where someone may be so frightened to come in and they wanna bring their friend the first time or something, but we really work to have someone that's not as connected to them. Now, with that said, they're all connected. <laughs> it's a more collectivist cultures. Most other countries are more collectivist. Um, I yeah, I don't know if it's most, but many other cultures and the cultures that come here are more collectivist. So they do tend to know one another, but we try to make it so that it's not too intense. We also do use Stratus, and um, which is the, the um, we call it ET. <laughs> it's, and I think that's what you use in the hospital too, right? And we'll use phones sometimes also, if we run into that situation. There's a question in the chat. Is there any progress in getting Medicaid to pay for translators? Yes. Medicaid pays for interpreters um, for our psychological services, but not for our social work services. And it's a big problem. We spent, we're a small clinic. We're a, a really tiny clinic and we spend almost $50,000 a year on interpreter services. Now, luckily I have grants to cover that, but you know, I'm constantly writing grants <laughs> to cover interpreter costs. And it's, but we do have it paid for psychological services, not for our legal services or social work services or um, physical therapy is covered. Thanks for reading the chat, Julie. <laughs> I can barely do it. Karen? Yes. What's been your experience dealing with the 
criminal justice system and um, the dealings with the police that your clients may have, and and more importantly, perhaps the uh, responsivity of the police to interventions that you might suggest, especially in this era that we're in right now with police and community relationships? Yeah, that's um, a good question. Um, we have worked with the police in the past. And I mean, I can tell you that most refugees are frightened <laughs> of the police, because if you think about it, it was their government, it was the militia, it was people in power, people, in, you know, dressed in, in um, the kinds of uniforms that police may wear. So they're very frightened of the police. Um, do they handle it well? Some do, some don't, is my experience. And um, we are really careful. We have called at times and said, you know, we really need a wellness check but we don't want you to go over in your uniform. Can you possibly do this in a different way? And there was a time, and I'm not sure they're still doing it, but there was a time when they would send um, someone over that was also a social worker and sort of got it. So that was helpful. But I think there has to be more communication for sure. Okay, we have a couple minutes. If anyone else has a question, I'll, you can pop your video on and I will wait for you. But if not, we'll say thank you very much, Karen. It's a pleasure to hear about your wonderful work um, and lots to think about. We'll see you around maybe or on the yeah. internet. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm.